In my past couple of videos, I have supplied links to resources you can donate to that are directly supplying aid to the individuals in Palestine affected by the ongoing genocide. Today, I am sharing the link to the website for the Palestine Children's Relief Fund, which is using donations to provide food, medical aid, and other necessary support to children in need in the midst of this crisis. The link for the Palestine Children's Relief Fund will be in the description below. Hi! Clearly, I am very normal about Digimon. I have it in my intro, so that probably tells you all you need to know about me and the relationship I have with the series. I've always been a proponent of certain media deemed as mid by many a critic and casual watcher alike, and when I'm not spending my time admitting defeat on how good Mighty Magiswords was or was not, I'm using it to explain Digimon and try to convince others why it doesn't deserve the bad rap it often gets. Today, I wanted to take the time to send my love letter to Digimon out into our digital world, however different our version may be. To start at the very beginning, at the birth of the very first strange creatures of our planet, the Cambrian Explosion, or Cambrian Era, was a time 500 million years ago in the history of Earth, characterized by a sudden burst of life. While the period did introduce larger and more complicated invertebrate life forms, it also brought the very first vertebrates into existence. All of these new creatures were very fish-like, with strange appearances and frightening numbers of eyes, spikes, and teeth the likes of which would scare even the bravest of horror indie game devs. Anomalocaris. I, I'm, I'm recording this after the fact. Ignore the low quality. So, what does this have to do with Digimon? Pretty much nothing, other than these animals being the forms that many future ones would evolve from and riff off of, a concept which Digimon uses as a mainframe for its premise. Even if you aren't a diehard for Digimon the way that I am, you may know that it began as a counterpart to a certain other popular hot trend of the 90s, but it might not be the one you're thinking of, no. Because Digimon was actually not intended to be seen as a direct competitor to Pokemon, but as a male oriented version of the Tamagotchi. In 1997, the very first Digimon apparatus, a handheld plastic case device with an LCD screen displaying pixelated pets for you to care for, was released. Born from a collaboration between Wiz and Bandai, the main gimmick to Digimon is that the various strange creatures you could obtain could be used to fight against one another, something that Tamagotchi was lacking for obvious reasons. By using a physical link cable to connect two devices, you could pit your digital pet up against one of your friends and either come out victorious or with an understanding understandably drained Digimon. The most important thing you need to know about these early games is that it cements the foremost and most likely familiar mechanic of evolving and leveling up your pet. You begin your care of your digital pet while it's at its most basic form some kind of small blob or lump-shaped thing, or what's called the baby level of Digimon, this baby Digimon will have a very simple range of attacks, and will be able to be trained, fed, and otherwise cared for in order to raise its level, strength, and to expand on the number of attacks, or the power of the attacks in its arsenal. Getting your Digimon to a high enough level will take it to its next stage in life, a bigger, more detailed in-training Digimon, and then further into the child or rookie level of Digimon. Once your Digimon reaches this level, it will be able to compete against other Digimon by the way of the link cable like I mentioned earlier. However, your Digimon can become stronger than this up to the champion level, and I think into the level above that which is called the mega level. The thing I like about the design of Digimon, created lovingly by Kenji Watanabe, is that they have so much more of a complicated flair the higher they get, more so than Pokemon, and while I'm not here to compare two queens, of course, I do think that Digimon designs do stretch into an obscene level in terms of how much detail they I have, not only just in late evolution, but pretty early into each monster's life. Obscene level is probably a good way to describe a lot of Digimon, actually. The first Digimon toy, sold under the name Digital Monster, was a pretty big hit and popular with younger boys, who were the target audience for the brand. But that's not to say that Digimon can only be enjoyed by young boys, of course. Even with about only half of the world's population of kids truly in mind, the first iteration of the Digital Monster sold 14 million units between 1997 and 2004, predominantly in the Japanese market. Kind of like how Satoshi Tajiri was inspired to create a game that encouraged conversation and cross-play between kids on the playground, Digimon prompted the exact same response leading to many a playground being clouded with groups of kids battling their Digimon. So, much like its cousin Tamagotchi, the ruckus and distraction caused by the digital monster toy led to its ban in quite a few schools in Asia, and got it deemed as one of those toys that got too big for its britches and much too distracting, mind-numbing, and even violent for kids to be spending their time with. There's a lot of history to just the virtual pet side of Digimon, and even more to be said about the many video games, manga, and card game, but I won't be covering any of these things because they aren't truly important to the animated series and additional movies, which I'm going to be focusing on. And at the end, I'll explain some of the things that I think get overlooked about it and what I think makes it a valuable experience to have and an entertaining series to watch. 
When the popularity for Digimon started to ramp up as the 90s ended, and to follow the footsteps of that other hot trend you might be thinking of, Pokemon, it seemed to Bandai that the next reasonable move to make for the Digimon brand would be to create a supplementary anime series. Or, actually, the very first idea was to make a short movie based on the toy, to be produced by Toei Animation. The movie is really interesting to me because if you really think about it coming first, it's actually, in my opinion, a lot harder to follow through with if you don't already know all of the characters and their interactions with one another, which is kind of weird because it's nothing like the plot of the show at all. For that reason, I think I actually want to talk about the series first, just because I think it benefits you to know more specifics going in. So, when the idea for the movie came to be in the late 90s, the storyboard was actually fully completed when the request for it to be morphed into an additional TV series came through from whoever. A 50 four episode long one at that. I don't watch a lot of anime and I'm more used to western animation because I'm a filthy American so this amount of show being one season is something I'm only familiar with because of Digimon. Like the Pokemon series, which Digimon would be in more serious competition with in this medium, the Digimon series would be airing for the majority of the year if not all of it. So you get a new episode for the first season of Digimon every weekend for exactly a year and then some, starting in March of 1999 and ending in late March of 2000. Before I go on, I think I should mention that Digimon is really broken up into six adaptations here in the West, and that's kind of how I like to see it since that's how I grew up watching it, so I'll just go over that real quick and give you an idea of what I'll be covering in the video. The first four series are actually amalgamated into one, which are Digimon Adventure 01, Digimon Adventure 02, Digimon Tamers, and Digimon Frontier, under the collective title of Digimon Digital Monsters, each with their own respective movie or multiple movies in some cases. So in the event you're going to watch this show in the West on streaming, most of the time these are all grouped up. Even though Tamers and Frontier have nothing to do with 01 and 02, other than like world building progression I guess, the final five series are treated as their own things. Those being Digimon Data Squad, Digimon Fusion, or Cross Wars, I think that's how you're supposed to pronounce it, I never have actually heard that said out loud because I've never seen it. Digimon Universe App Monsters, Digimon Adventure 2020, and Digimon Ghost Game. I'm not too familiar with the latter five, so today won't be the day for me to talk about them, but maybe in the future I'll give them a watch and determine if they're video worthy. If you plan on watching any Digimon, maybe come back to this video because I will be spoiling some major plot twists and generally unexpected insanity along the way but I will try to refrain from doing that too much. With 54 episodes and an original run in Japan from 1999 to 2000, Digimon Adventure 01, the one that started it all, is a fan favorite among the 9 or 10 Digimon fans out there, and other than the fact that it's the first season and the most nostalgic, there are many other reasons to love it. We're first introduced to our main human characters at summer camp, specifically on August 1st of 1999, where they all happen to see some strange anomaly in the sky that sucks them into the digital world, and where each of the seven of these children are introduced to their respective Digimon counterparts. One thing I find to be very unique about Digimon is that the character's main goal is not to capture a bunch of animals and fight them against one another, but that they actually don't want to be in that situation and have the much more realistic and relatable goal to get back home. Since every, insert whatever type of anime Digimon is here, anime, needs a main hero, Digimon has its own in the form of Tai Kamiya. Yeah, I'm gonna use their westernized names, I'm sorry. Who is a relatively cocky and headstrong young boy, who enacts himself as the leader of the group and oftentimes puts them in more danger than what he means to. I'll probably talk more on the many arcs of Digimon 01 later, but he does get some realistic development and learns more about what being a team player means. His Digimon is the somewhat naive and inexperienced Agumon, a small dinosaur Digimon who is much more laid back and non-confrontational compared to his partner. Tai has another foil to himself, which is Matt Ishida, our second human character, who is kind of like this edgelord type, kind of quiet and lone wolfish, at least at the beginning. Before all of the characters kind of become more intertwined and familiar with each other, this is kind of how he remains. They're often depicted as bickering frenemies, and I like to even say that the predominant three characters in 01 are mirrored extremely by Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura for a more familiar comparison. Matt's Digimon is a lizard type creature wearing some kind of fur pelt named Gabumon, who is very reserved and almost shy. Kind of a quiet character who really just plays along with whatever Matt is doing, while offering him and whoever else is involved his own perspective. Something I like about Digimon is that it has multiple female main characters, and the first one is Sora Takenuchi, a tomboyish girl who is probably a stronger leader than Tai in my opinion, mostly because she's more level-headed and seems to make more educated choices rather than going into it blindly like Tai, or possibly overthinking or complicating things like Matt sometimes suggests. 
Her Digimon is Biomon, a little bird who has just as big of a heart as her partner, and relies on her closely for guidance, almost seeming to treat her as a mother of sorts. Our next character is Izzy Izumi, who is a computer nerd and more technically smart than the other characters, giving him somewhat of an edge in the digital world and making him pretty much invaluable to the effort of navigating it. The only downside to this, which Digimon is actually pretty realistic for in illustrating flaws in its characters pretty often, is that he can become wrapped up in what he thinks is the technical answer, only to find that things could have been solved more easily if he wasn't so hyper-focused on learning more about the curiosities of the digital world. His partner is Tentamon, a bug-like Digimon who shares both Izzy's curiosity and intelligence, but is also impervious to Izzy's tendency to become distracted by it, often snapping him out of his little bubble and getting him to interact more with the other kids and share his findings and curiosities more freely to get a collective thought process going. Mimi Tachikawa is our fifth character and more of a girly girl type and sort of vain and self-absorbed, at least to begin with. She kind of tends to let things fall on the other kids, being unargumentative for the most part and avoiding any sort of trouble for herself, especially when things are challenging. As the series progresses, she too becomes more involved in what the group is aiming towards doing and kind of acts as the heart and more grounded down-to-earth voice when discussing what good there is to a situation. She's kind of silly and I love her a lot. Her partner Digimon is Palmon, who is basically just a living cactus. She plays a big part in showing Mimi how to be less materialistic and more appreciative of both her friends and the more simple aspects of life. Our next character, the goat Jokido, is another character with the smart nerd trope but kind of in a different flavor than Izzy, since he's more book smart than technological. He's mostly a worrisome and anxious character who actually ends up shouldering a lot of the responsibility for how things pan out on his own accord, something that goes pretty unspoken but nonetheless illustrated by his frequent outbursts of wanting to be more decisive and leaderish, but then falling short because of his being a little wishy-washy, again, a trait he sheds later down the line because of his more bold and brash Digimon Gomamon, a seal-looking creature who could not have a worry in the world and just lets things roll off his back rather than getting hung up on them. He kind of just goes with the flow of whatever happens and is more confident in his decisions, teaching Joe to act the same over time. Last but not least, TK Takaishi, the final child in the group and the youngest at that, is Matt's younger brother who just wants to live up to what he thinks will impress him. Since he's so young, he follows the others and what they say as pretty much final and doesn't tend to stray away from the general plan or expectation unless there's something he realizes that everyone else doesn't, which does happen in the series from time to time. His Digimon is Patamon, who is just about as young and impressionable as TK himself, and appears as somewhat of a hamster or pig or some kind of fat bat, I don't know. Patamon is treated by TK as a close friend, and kind of like how Matt tends to baby TK, he does this to Patamon in an effort to keep him safe. But most of the three's arc is characterized by letting go and letting both TK and Patamon blossom, which benefits the group on more than one occasion. Our human characters are regularly referred to as a collective called the Digi-Destined, which is how I'm going to refer to them from now on to keep things less wordy. Since L1 lasts such a long time and kind of has the pressure of keeping things interesting for 54 weeks, the season has multiple arcs, some of which are more filler than others. It's kind of smart in the way that the series progresses because it progresses in the way that raising a digital monster might, with the Digimon in the show reaching higher levels as the show goes on. The first arc consists of the Digi-Destined arriving in the digital world, with each episode following being dedicated to each child in their Digimon, usually ending with that Digimon evolving from their child stage to their champion evolution. After this, the children learn that they are the prophesied heroes that are meant to save the digital world from an evil overlord named Devimon, and only then will they be able to return home. This overarching goal in mind, the series introduces more concepts as it goes on, such as corrupt Digimon needing to be fought and saved, crests particular to each child that can be used to activate stronger evolutions for their Digimon, and a mysterious 8th Digi Destin that turns out to be Tai's younger sister Kari, who is just as curious and explored of as her brother, particularly getting along with TK because of their age and similar positive outlook. Her partner is Gatomon, a cat who shares Kari's desire to explore the world and encourages her to trust her intuition when she picks up on certain clues and finds any leads to follow. Another thing I like about Digimon, and that's a phrase I'm going to repeat throughout this video, is the fact that the Digimon are treated more like partners that you just have one of, and rather than keeping them captive and kind of throwing them into human matters and making them fight, you kind of bond with them a little more personally and they make the choices to defend both you and themselves by their own accord. There is no way to keep a Digimon captive, at least not in the mainline series, but the Digidestin do have small devices similar to the digital monster toy that do allow them to both evolve and monitor their Digimon. I could honestly keep on going about 01 because I love the characters and the plot is honestly the strongest it ever is in this season, and I might even give 01 and 02 their own video, but I have to move on. And it's time to talk about the movie Digimon Adventure. It's time for the moment you've been waiting for! Duh. 
Like I mentioned before, the movie doesn't follow the canon of the series and instead begins with and is mainly driven by the digital world bleeding over into the real world, rather than the kids being taken there. The cast is much younger and only shows Tai and Kari, who find a Digimon in their home, who bonds with them and then protects both them and the city they live in from a second Digimon, evolving into its champion level to do so. This movie is kind of short, about 20 minutes or so, and it actually got tacked onto the second movie, Digimon Adventure R War Game, which does show most of the other cast for various and unequal lengths of time, unfortunately, but also continues to follow the plot of the digital world affecting the real one. With the main plot being that an evil Digimon is basically trying to hack into the mainframe of all human technology and use it to end the world. And the funny thing is that this is supposed to be this like fun, Pokemon-esque, kid-friendly experience removed from reality and set in a sci-fi fantasy world. But the main threat enacted by this Digimon is literally that it hacks into the Pentagon and tries to nuke Tokyo. This movie evokes such an emotion in me, I can't really describe it. Like, the animation is so beautiful and haunting, and the plot only heightens that, but at the same time, it's driven by visuals that are the most early 2000s webcore stuff I think I've ever seen is perfect. I love this movie and it's perfect, and the only thing that can make it better is if they showed Joe for more than 9 seconds, or showed Mimi at all, at least in the version I'm referring to, which I'll elaborate on. This movie is followed in continuity with the movie based on O2, which I will need to talk about first. Duh. However much I love O1, I love O2 just as much, if not a little more. Not only do we get new characters, but the integration of these new characters with the ones from O1 feels really natural and it's not like they're just throwing us into this new experience with new characters and expecting us to just accept it and adapt. Airing 50 episodes between April of 2000 and March of 2001, O2 takes place 4 years after the end of O1 and introduces 3 new characters and their respective Digimon. Our first new character is Davis Motomiya, who is extremely similar to Tai in the way that that he's overly confident in himself and can be equally impulsive and gets jealous and competitive to boot, but like it usually happens with Digimon characters, he kind of goes through metamorphosis and his character evolves, for lack of a less pun-adjacent descriptor. His partner Digimon is Vmon, a lizardish Digimon who has some of my favorite evolutions in the entire series. He's kind of similar to Agumon, but I would say that he's kind of more humorous and playful and only takes things seriously at the exact moment where they need to be, and I think that's kind of relatable. The next character is Yoli Inoue, a girl who is literally me and she's awesome and smart and she's kind of like if Joe and Izzy combined into one mega nerd, but she does also suffer from being a victim to her own drive, being almost as impulsive as Davis at times, who she does butt heads with on occasion. Her partner is Hawkmon, a hawk Digimon who is described by the wiki as being a stereotypical British gentleman, which is honestly super funny and accurate for the most part. He's super polite and helpful and offers his help and guidance to Yoli when she becomes overwhelmed with the situation at hand and needs that little boost to keep her feet on the ground. Finally, we have Cody Hida, a young boy who is very quiet and self-contained in comparison to the other two characters, who is actually usually the voice of reason and more thoughtful about the crazy shenanigans they have to get up to or whatever. His partner is Armadillomon, a silly little armadillo Digimon who sounds like a little cut Mr. Cowboy. He's so cute. I love this one. He's pretty laid back and chill and kind of shows Cody that life can be whimsical and fun if you stop worrying about things so much. The original Digi Destined are in the season 2 and are depicted with new designs to show that they are much older than what we last saw them. While most of them have noticeably lesser roles, predominantly acting as mentors for the new three, both TK and Kari stay as regulars so the main cast is more well-rounded. The plot of the season is a bit more complicated as you'll notice as the series goes on, but the main idea is that the digital world is once again practically enslaved by a new dark evil, this time to a much more serious degree. Some weird Wunzler-esque guy named the Digimon Emperor has taken the world's population captive and erected these spires that block all Digimon from evolving. To get around this, O2 introduces a new version of Digimon Evolution, or Digivolution as it gets called, where each of the five kids are given these eggs to perform an armor Digivolution on their Digimon. To integrate the original cast more, these eggs are based directly on their crests, 
and are given from the original bearer to each new character, with TK gaining a single egg based on his Crest of Hope, and Kari gaining an egg based on her Crest of Light. The other three get two eggs, with Davis receiving one based on Ty's Crest of Courage, and the other on Matt's Crest of Friendship, Yoli gets two eggs based on Sora's Crest of Love, and Mimi's Crest of Sincerity, and Cody's two eggs are based on Izzy's Crest of Knowledge, and Joe's Crest of Reliability. Using the various evolutions that these eggs allow, the new kids are able to stop the Digimon Emperor with the guidance of the original cast and their knowledge of how the digital world functions. At the end of the first arc, they find that the Digimon Emperor is not this crazy man bent on the destruction of the digital world, but rather a mysterious and possibly misguided boy with a dark and brooding past named Ken Ichijoji. His whole story is that he's this genius who was pretty much tricked by another man into becoming the Digimon Emperor under the idea that it's all a game. This of course happening after Ken's older brother's death leaving him more impressionable and unsure of what to do. He has his own Digimon named Wormmon, a sweet little caterpillar Digimon who is very timid and often a victim to Ken's anger and mistreatment while he's the Digimon Emperor, which does come into play in the middle of the series, where he helps the Digidestin stop Ken, who later reforms into a much nicer and more compassionate young boy, although with his dark actions and past memories still very much in the forefront. After this happens, many of the Digimon that Ken used as second hands to his rule over the world continue to contribute to the same higher evil that made Ken the way he was, and a second gimmick is introduced, that being DNA Digivolution, which allows two champion Digimon to fuse into an even cooler ultimate one. The plot does get a little muddy and unnecessarily complicated after this, in my opinion, but all you really need to know is that all of the evil in the world is being spread by a man named Oikawa, who himself is later found out to be under the control of the evil Digimon Myotismon, who the kids then defeat with Oikawa having to sacrifice himself in order to do so. This season ends with an epilogue that shows all of the Digidestined, new and old, 25 years later where they all have families and kids and stuff, and it's all very cute and heartwarming, and here is where our story ends with this lovable group of wonderful characters, for the time being, and for the video anyway. O2 is accompanied by its own movie that somewhat plays with the same continuity as both the TV series and the previous movie. It's actually split into two parts, but for my own sake I'll just explain them as one. Basically, this movie takes place in the United States, where TK and Kari have traveled to visit Mimi, but also meet Willis, a boy who has not one, but two whole partner Digimon, those being Terriermon and Pokemon. The latter of which has been corrupted with a virus and has now enacted an attack on the other Digidestined, leaving TK and Kari to locate the new cast from O2 to help them rescue their friends and stop this Digimon from creating any more problems. This movie is a bit lackluster in comparison to the first couple, but it gets the job done, and I think it's a pretty fun watch anyway. That and it's pretty heavily removed from the events of the series, so you don't need to know as much about O2 as much as you need to know things about O1 and its movies. I did purposefully leave out some air dates for these movies because in the West, all three were severely cut down and smashed together to create Digimon the movie, a theatrical version of the movies that, at one point, I had seen enough and so often that I could quote it from memory. I want to even say that the three or technically like four original movies are nearly impossible to watch in full, so what I know about them is based on this western adaptation. It's still pretty clearly split into three acts, with the O2 movies being present day, our war game taking place four years before that, and the original short film being tacked on as a prologue taking place eight years prior to that. This movie saw pretty low ratings, although more than tripling its $5 million budget when it hit the box office in 2000. Again, I love this movie. I think there's a different experience to be had if you watch the original movie separately in their true length, but I have yet to do that and I'm perfectly content to treat this movie how I have been treating it as the most cohesive way to patch the three together. I also think it's worth mentioning that in mid-2023, it was announced that both this movie and the individual movies that it's composed of are going to be given new English dubs with as much of the original cast as possible, which I'm pretty sure marks the very first time the original movies will be dubbed over in English and made more accessible to fans. As not to exhaust the original cast and keep things fresh and interesting, Season 3, or Tamers, aired 51 episodes between April of 2001 and March of 2002, and takes place in an entirely different continuity and has entirely different characters. I have only seen about 30 or so episodes of this season, so I don't know everything, but I will try to explain the best I can. In this universe, the concept of Digimon already kind of exists as a card game in the real world, and as a result of a strange power from the digital world manifesting itself there, Digimon actually start invading the real world and therefore need to be stopped to return things to normal. To assist in this process, we have a few initial characters who find themselves in the possession of Digivices with a strange ability to scan Digimon cards which will then somehow influence or evolve their partner Digimon. Our main character this time around is Takato Matsuki who is already a diehard Digimon fan by the time we get to him and start learning things about the series. One thing I do enjoy about him is that he's kind of an outlier from the whole cocky, brash leader type, and while he's able to take charge and kind of serve as the voice of reason or authority at times, he's much more heartful 
Felt N has a more reserved personality when compared to his predecessors. His Digimon is Guilmon, who is actually a dinosaur looking Digimon of his own creation. When he first gains his Digivice, he uses it to scan a drawing he made of his own original Digimon, thus bringing it to life. Because he was literally born yesterday, Guilmon is kind of confused by how the world works, often confusing or blurring the line between what the real world is and what the digital world is like. What's wrong? Aww. Your eyes are looking, Takato Man. Over time, he comes to see Takato as a loyal friend and his protector in a way, and also learns more about his world and the digital world because of this. The second main character, Rika Nonaka, is a girl who has devoted a lot of time and effort into Digimon, even being dubbed as a champion of the game. Of course, this meant that when Digimon started coming over into the real world, and she found herself paired with a Digimon of her own, she had more of an instinct to treat taming the wild Digimon as some kind of competitive game, only really caring about fighting and being the best at doing so so more Pokemon-like in nature. Her personality is passive and somewhat cold, at least at first, and she can be a little off-putting and intimidating, just like her partner Digimon Rainamon, who appears as a very tall fox-like creature that stands on two legs, about twice the size of a given human character. She's quite a serious and almost edgy Digimon, and has a similar drive to her partner to become stronger. She has some really cool Digivolutions, and she's also one of my favorite characters in Digimon as a whole. While there are additional supporting characters who I will talk about briefly, the final main character is Henry Wong who is honestly a very interesting character and one of my personal favorite human characters because of it. He's relatively confident and mature, but also humble and not letting it get to his head or pushing himself as the leader or butting heads with Takato in any way. However, he is somewhat of a foil to him in his thought process. Whereas Takato can have more of a childlike thought process, being almost as naive and uneducated about the world and the dangers of Digimon as his partner, Henry seems to have a lot more experience and knows his way around a few things regarding technology and caring for his partner Digimon, Terriermon, who is a white and green rabbit-like creature who is supposed to be a terrier like his name suggests, but I think he looks more like some weird rabbit. Anyway, Terriermon is a silly little guy who is functionally similar to Gomamon in the way that he's fairly laid back and always provides a good view of the situation at hand, encouraging his partner and friends to take things easy, but is also a very competent fighter despite his initial cutesy appearance. Since the other characters only become truly important later down the line, I'll just talk about them when they become relevant to make everything easier to follow along with. Since the preceding two series mostly depicted Digimon as peaceful and friendly to one another, if not corrupted or influenced by some higher evil, the theme of this one really takes things back to the roots of fighting Digimon against one another, reiterating that the nature of all Digimon is to fight to become stronger, reminding the viewer that these are wild monsters that are quite dangerous and unpredictable when left to their own devices. This is explored somewhat in some arc or something in 01, but lessened by the corruption going on in 02, so a return to seeing Digimon acting the way they're technically supposed to is interesting to say the least. After we're introduced to the main characters, we learn of an agency called Hypnos, which is working to cleanse the world of the Digimon and send them back home, one that the three main kins align themselves with and begin to assist around the early parts of the series or so. This agency is countered by the Devas, a group of 12 very powerful Digimon whose main goal is basically to maintain the digital world and keep it from entering the real one. Out of a general hatred for humanity, for whatever reason or any way, that's the only motivation I could gather. After some of the Devas enter the real world, the Tamers chase them back into the digital world, where the remaining Devas they were unable to stop reside. Mainly misguided in their desire to protect the digital world, they go to extreme lengths to keep humanity from interacting with it, which means that the Tamers do have to stop most, if not all of them, as the series progresses. The main enemy in this series is the D Reaper, a virus-like entity created by man that is now trying to invade and end both the digital world and the real one. It's kind of really overly complicated stuff and kind of weird to write, expecting kids to be able to follow, but it probably gets portrayed in a way that makes a lot more sense watching through it. At this point, the only other two major characters are Jari Kato and Ryo Akiyama, the former of which is a young girl and Takato's classmate, who is both outgoing and somewhat mysterious. She comes across as pretty happy with kind of a weird girl vibe to her, and later in the series, she befriends Leomon, a huge bipedal lion Digimon who's kind of fatherly to Jerry and seeks to protect her alongside protecting the world from the Digimon and the digital world from being destroyed. After Leomon unfortunately dies, Jerry falls into a depression and in her vulnerability is captured and used as a puppet by the D-Reaper to further invade the real world, not being able to cross over in its current form and rather using various counterparts to do it for itself. Ryo, on the other hand, is a boy who is a bit older than the main cast and already knows the digital world and its Digimon like the back of his hand, being even more skilled and experienced than Rika, and actually did appear briefly in O2 and even has ties with Ken, but that's neither important to me or clear on how it was implemented, so I will not be discussing it any further. His partner is Cybergermon, an ultimate form bipedal dragon-like Digimon with huge wings and metal accents. Pretty cool stuff. 
Cyber Jermon acts a little more wildly than his companions, and his ultimate level not only makes him very strong, but also very threatening. However, Ryo has been his partner for years and keeps him in check when he needs it. Long story short, the D-Reaper makes its way into the real world, and the Tamers, now four in official number, are tasked with stopping it and saving the world. This series is pretty cool and somewhat dark in tone, more so than the previous two seasons, but again, I'll elaborate on just how dark I think the overall Digimon series can get. Tamers actually got two movies, which I know basically nothing about, but from what I can tell, they kind of had nothing to do with the continuity of the series, and even have some continuity errors in the few places where they do attempt to derive things from the source material. So I'm just gonna come to the conclusion that you don't really need to watch these movies to gain anything more about Tamers, so I prefer to just see it as their additional material with the same characters. Since I have you here and I don't know where else to shoehorn an explanation on it, Digimon introduces a few Digivolution gimmicks every season, with O1 having Metal Digivolution, which evolves some Digimon into more metallic and mechanical looking stages, Warp Digivolution, which allows you to skip one level right into the next, most usually from the child stage into the ultimate stage, and even Dark Digivolution, which evolves your Digimon into some kind of dark offshoot of itself. Other than DNA Digivolution and Armor Digivolution in O2, there isn't much more, but in Tamers, besides the additional forms that the cards provide, there is something called Bio-Merging, in which the four main Tamers are able to fuse with their Digimon to evolve them straight into their most powerful form. The only reason why I'm mentioning this now is that I truly think that this one gimmick is the driving inspiration for our next and final series I'll be talking about in this video anyway, which is Digimon Frontier, which aired 50 episodes between April of 2002 and late March of 2003. Yo, yo, yo! Ah! So this is the Digimon series in my intro because it's honestly my favorite one. It's kind of the overlooked child in the quartet of siblings, but I genuinely think that it maintains the feeling of the adventure in O1 a lot more interestingly than Tamers or even O2. The main plot of this series is that once again, a group of kids is mysteriously transported into the digital world, and more so than anything, they desire to go home, but are involuntarily wrapped up in a bigger danger and have to help out and keep the world from being destroyed. The brink of collapse is brought to the digital world by what I can only simplify as Digimon racism, which I kind of have to explain before we get into the whole talking about the characters and the gimmick this series introduces. While there are multiple different kinds of Digimon, each resembling some kind of species either real to us or completely made up, they can all be divided into two distinct classifications. One being the human Digimon, who appear as human forms such as angels and knights to name a few, and then the animalistic beast Digimon, the other group which encompasses every other Digimon that is non-human in appearance. So your dinosaurs and birds and plants and bugs and stuff like that. It probably doesn't technically follow the form of things being beastly in nature, but it just it literally just means anything other than something that stands on two legs and looks like a blonde human. Which another thing, a lot of the human form Digimon are blonde for some reason, I don't know why that is. Anyway, enough waffling, on a particular day in a train station, our main five characters are gathered there after being sent a mysterious text telling them to board a train within the station. All for their own various reasons and motivations, they do so and are promptly taken by this train to the digital world, where they find themselves in possession of a strange power and are then burdened with having to save the world in order to be sent home. This power is called Spirit Evolution, which allows our human characters to transform into Digimon and then back again when they become weakened or otherwise aren't in need of their Digimon form any longer. Over time, they adapt to the use of both beast and human Digimon forms, and then some even get a third hybrid form. We start out with these five kids, the leader of which is Takuya Kambara, who is once again a cocky type, and while he is sort of overly confident in himself, he is much quicker to be more collaborative with his allies and has a strong sense of what's right. His three forms are based on fire and include the human spirit Digimon Agunimon, the beast spirit Digimon Burning Greymon, and the hybrid spirit Digimon Aldemon. The secondary character is another lone wolf type named Koji Minamoto, whose characterization is really funny to me because it actually influences his transformations and I think that's neat. He's kind of distant and not wanting to really interact with the other kids at first. He's your basic, I don't need anyone, brooding type and he often gets into pointless little spats with Takuya, but he comes around by the end of the series and he's seen more of just kind of a cool guy, I guess, kind of like Matt. His Digimon forms are based on light, the three of which are the human spirit Digimon Lobomon, the beast spirit Digimon Kendo Gururumon, and the hybrid spirit Digimon Beowulfmon. The only female character in the group this time, Zoe Orimoto, is kind of what I would consider to be a mix of Sora and Mimi, 
because she's both pretty opinionated and has a tendency to be the one breaking up any arguments, and is really capable of navigating the world and giving her thoughts about what they should do. But she's still really girly and silly in the way that Mimi is. I just realized that this series can't pass the Bechdel test, I'm devastated. Her forms are all based on wind and are the human spirit Digimon Kazemon and the beast spirit Digimon Zephyrmon. Zephromon. <laughs> Can we get a Zephromon? <laughs> Next is JP Shibuyama, who is a lovable idiot and usually the comic relief in an otherwise confusing or scary situation. He's really sweet and kind of protective over the other kids because he is older, but he's particularly close with Tommy, the youngest character, who I'll talk about in a second. JP's two forms are based on Thunder and are the human spirit Digimon Beetlemon and the beast spirit Digimon Melokabuterimon. Finally, Tommy Himi is the group's youngest member and is pretty similar to TK in 01, having a more relaxed and childlike like view of the world. I think for the most part, he doesn't come to realize the true danger of some of the situations they get into and would rather indulge in the fun that the digital world can offer. He later learns to be more cautious and approach the world with a less rosy lens, but of course that's not to say that he becomes completely cynical. His Digimon forms are based on ice and are the human spirit Digimon Kumamon and the beast spirit Digimon Kori Kakumon. The kids are accompanied by two Digimon named Bokomon and Nimon, one that's more smart and helpful in his guidance, and one who's just being himself, to be honest, he's silly. The story in this series is honestly pretty straightforward, but still manages to be just as interesting and involved as the past stories explored in Digimon. The kids learn that, of three Digimon who were once sworn to protect the world, one named Cherubimon became evil and corrupt and was the one to drive the violent divide between the beast and human Digimon. With his own group of warriors under his control, Cherubimon seeks to awaken an even more powerful and scary Digimon named Lusamon, who will surely end the world if he is awoken. In between some pretty fun explorations of the world around them, the forces of evil become stronger, and the Digi doesn't have to face off against these enemies, one of which has a very strange backstory, and ends up being Koji's twin brother, Koichi Kaimura, who he's on pretty distant terms with due to their parents' divorce. Under the influence and control of Chirubimon, Koichi has two non-specific forms, those being the human spirit Digimon Duskmon and the beast spirit Digimon Velgamon. After a slew of face-offs with Koichi's Digimon forms, they're able to finally defeat him and manage to cure his corruption. So then after that, he has two kind of less scary forms, both based on darkness. These are the human spirit Digimon Lomon and the beast spirit Digimon Jaeger Lomon, meaning that all in all, Koichi is special and gets four different forms throughout the series. After he's saved, Koichi is a really sweet and caring and laid-back kid whose dark past doesn't seem to affect him too much. What he really cares about the most is reconnecting with his brother, which he does so more as the series progresses and ends. The now six kids are able to stop Lusamon, but not before he's able to escape into the real world, reach a higher form, and actually kill Koichi, like genuinely kill him, as in they show him in the hospital and he's literally dead and it's the craziest thing I've ever seen in a Digimon series. But it ends up that some kind of digital magic or something is able to bring him back to life and it's a very sweet ending and I adore this whole cast a lot. Frontier got its own movie, which is just as inconsequential to the story as the ones for Tamers are, so I'm not really going to talk about those either. I know that the goal of this video is primarily to educate people about what Digimon is, or maybe just give you a refresher if you're already a fan, but I kind of wanted to write a portion kind of defending my view of Digimon and what I think makes it a genuinely cool show, especially in comparison with Pokemon, who it has always been in an unfair competition with. One of the major things that I think sets Digimon apart from Pokemon is that Digimon doesn't relegate the darkness and character development to its movies the way that Pokemon usually does, but it addresses these topics on a regular basis in the show. For example, in 01, each character and their partner Digimon are either similar to one another or opposites, and they teach one another to change their perspective, giving every character in the show an opportunity to evolve and change, both humans and Digimon alike. The tie that we start with is definitely not the one that we end the series with, and though he is isn't that much different fundamentally, we're shown how the whole experience over the series has altered him as a person. On the other hand, you can literally pick any version of Ash from Pokemon and get pretty much the same character. And maybe there's some kind of development between the beginning and end of each season, but it doesn't always follow over into the next season. Most, if not all, of Ash's growth as a character comes at some kind of nexus both in the show and the movies. For the characters in Digimon, it's more gradual and doesn't take just one sole event to change them. Digimon also isn't afraid to take itself seriously even though the entire concept of Digimon and the world where it normally takes place is kind of whimsical and painted in this fun way for the most part, only with certain dangers being presented along the way. There are multiple occasions in Digimon where kids are taken advantage of and corrupted and used as puppets for a higher evil and something that they don't even want to take part in in the first place. The whole I'm in this mysterious world and all I want is to get home thing is much scarier if you consider that at any time, you could be forced into being a servant for some bad guy bent on destroying the very world you're in 
and the one you come from. Digimon also tends to treat death seriously and sometimes permanently, with the death of Leomon having a direct and heavily consequential effect on Jerry and then on the rest of the series of Tamers. I also think that the show being very candid about its characters' past and home lives make the characters much more real and therefore more relatable. I didn't talk about it too much per season because it made the video read kind of clunky, but almost every character in Digimon has the details of their family, friends, and personal life either given to us from the get-go or gradually learned through flashbacks or monologues or just basic conversation with the other characters in their Digimon. Between Koji and Koichi's parents being divorced, Izzy being adopted, Cody being raised by his grandfather, Ken having lost his older brother and being manipulated by a fatherly figure, Henry learning that his father is basically evil, Rika having a single mother who she's distant with and having a more motherly figure in the form of her Digimon, and many of the Digi destined being shown to end up as single parents themselves at the end of O2 makes these characters so much more relatable and real because these are real things that can happen to someone. Just because your home life isn't ideal doesn't mean you can't amount to something more. And just because you've done these great things, it doesn't guarantee that everything else in your life will go according to plan, if those kinds of things are what you want to begin with. I can't really think of an instance where a Pokemon character's home life is discussed, let alone brought into the focus the way that it happens for characters in Digimon. Though to be fair, I just might not know of any instances. Another thing that makes Digimon as a series stronger than people think is that the Digimon are able to be treated more like companions than tools, and are given the choice to fight themselves, rather than being told to fight and directed on what moves to use. It's always in self-defense in 01, 02, and Frontier, and comes out of an already competitive nature in Tamers. Instead of being disrupted by the interference of humanity, Digimon are sort of free to do their own thing anyway, with the very few humans brought into the world only being there to help it. I think that for Tamers specifically, there's even a bigger narrative to be explored, where humans are directly responsible for the corruption of the digital world and end up almost paying for it with their own extinction. Another thing I noticed is that in Pokemon, Pokemon, the world is kind of molded from both Pokemon and humans being able to live together peacefully, but I think there's even more of a sense of adventure in Digimon because the digital world is this big unknown and not something that the kids are usually familiar with beforehand. And finally, I think it might just come from bias, but I felt like I had more fun in general watching Digimon than I did Pokemon at any time for reasons I wasn't sure of at the moment I was doing it, but have come to realize while making this video and forcing myself to compare the two, which I usually try not to do. I think that people can generally agree with me when I say that Pokemon is obviously more popular and superior in terms of its games, but Digimon as an animated series has a lot more merit to it than being a simple Pokemon alternative or clone, which is all I've written this part to convince you of. Luckily for me, it seems like Digimon has a pretty cult following and has been allowed to be kept pretty alive and well for all these years since our journey first began in 1999. So that's everything I'll be talking about today. I know that there's so much more content I could cover and I do plan to do it in the future when I'm more well-read on it. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you in the next one.